Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 371. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. This week's episode of Therapy Chat is sponsored by Trauma Therapist Network. Because trauma is real, healing is possible, and help is available. Go to traumatherapistnetwork.com to find a trauma therapist near you. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I am so happy this conversation was so resonant for me. I think What I love the most about Dr. Shafali's work is that she speaks compassionately about parenting, but she's also not sugarcoating the fact that we, when we become parents, suddenly we're the all-powerful authority and we feel like we are ruling everything. And then when our children don't do things exactly the way we expect them to, or we think they should, or the way we did, or the way we want them to, we can get all bent out of shape. And I see this all the time as a therapist and a group practice owner. In my years of being a therapist, I've learned that most of the time when parents want something to change with their children's behavior, the change has to come from the parent first. And we don't like to see that. But the good news is it's a beautiful opportunity for us to heal our own wounds that are unresolved. And we don't think we have any wounds. In fact, later next week, you're going to hear me interview Casey Compton. And she talked about how you might not think that you have any wounds. You might think that you're just perfectly fine. I definitely felt that way. And Casey talks about the same kind of thing, like, what? I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. And then when you look a little deeper, you scratch beneath the surface, you see that there's all this pain from when you were younger that you never knew how to deal with. Maybe your parents never knew how to deal with. And that's why it's just there, just stuck, unresolved. And then you have children and it all is right in your face. It's not always from the moment that they're born. Sometimes it's when they reach a certain age, when something hits you that you never thought about before. That definitely happened to me with my children. When my second child turned six, something that had happened to me when I was six came crashing down into my awareness when I had no real conscious thought that that was an impactful experience to my life until my second child turned six, not my first child. So it sneaks up on you. And then when it does, it hits you over the head or slaps you in the cheek. It's pretty shocking. So I love the conversation that we had today because my guest, Dr. Shafali Sabari, talks about how to become a conscious parent. That's the basis for the beginning of her book. And then she goes into how to do the work to basically reparent yourself so that you can be the parent for your children that they deserve, that you want them to have, the parent that they can trust, feel safe with, and connect with. Because that's really what it's about. It's not even about how much you love them or how much they love you. It's about how safe they feel with you and how much they can trust you to be there for them unconditionally, just as they are. And all of the ways that we were not loved unconditionally 
can really stand in the way of us seeing our children as they are and allowing them to be who they are and accepting them and loving them and embracing them for exactly who they are. But that's what Dr. Shafali is challenging us to do. So I loved this conversation. I'm so glad that we got to speak more in depth about her newest book, The Parenting Map. So let me tell you a little bit more about my guest today. Before we actually get into the conversation, I just want to tell you a little bit more about who I'm talking with. My guest today is Dr. Shafali. Dr. Shafali received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Columbia University, specializing in the integration of Western psychology and Eastern philosophy. She brings together the best of both worlds for her clients. She's an expert in family dynamics and personal development, teaching courses around the globe. And she has written five books, three of which are New York Times bestsellers, including her two landmark books, The Conscious Parent and The Awakened Family. Before her newest book, she wrote A Radical Awakening, and her newest book is called The Parenting Map. And it's a great book. It really lays out step by step how to parent in a way that your children can really thrive. And I'm so excited to share this conversation with you. I hope that you will enjoy listening to it as well. And as always, I just want to thank you for listening to Therapy Chat. If you are not already on my email list, I invite you to go join my email list and you can sign up to receive a a free PDF download, something I put together that lists the five common mistakes that people make when searching for a trauma therapist. And it also includes recommendations, resources, and information to help you learn about trauma and find a trauma therapist. So go to the show notes and you'll see the link to sign up for my email list if you're not already there and grab that free PDF five common mistakes of people who are searching for a trauma therapist. Now let's dive right into my conversation with Dr. Shafali. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm so excited to be talking with an internationally known expert on parenting and conscious parenting, Dr. Shafali. Dr. Shafali, thanks so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited too. And we're doing this on video, which is like super awkward for me, but it's a fun new adventure. So I wanted to talk with you about your newest book and all the amazing things you're doing. I love the way you approach parenting and it's such a important area of focus. But before we get into talking about your newest book, can you just start off by telling our audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure. So I'm a clinical psychologist and like you, I work with clients and I've kept working with clients, actually, because it keeps me grounded and connected to what parents are suffering around and how the latest modern trends are affecting their children. So I have a daily, almost daily client practice over Zoom. I also, you know, teach all over the world. I've written, this is my fifth book now that I'm here to talk about. It's called The Parenting Map. I'm going to hold it up. I'm so excited for it. Even though I had written so many other books on parenting, Parents were still asking me, but how, but how? So this book is the how to heal yourself to become the most conscious parent ever. Also, I have a coaching institute. So I know many of your listeners are therapists and educators. I have a conscious coaching training institute where I train people to become coaches in my method. So even if you're not a therapist or a co psychologist background or anything like that, I have so many non-parents, non-educators, non-psych joining my institute. It's a five-month online program where I train people to become the most conscious coaches they can be so that they can go out there and help parents become conscious parents. Wow. So the coaching is to learn to be a parenting coach? Yes, yes. So they not only heal themselves because ultimately you have to work on your own issues, but I actually train them to have a livelihood where at home they can learn how to set up a business and actually become a coach to help other parents become conscious parents and help families and, and you know, really do insightful coaching. And I have people who literally started without any background in psychology and they today have thriving home businesses 
and they love what they do because they get to help people. But these are people who've truly been moved by the message of conscious parenting in their own lives. And so then they apply it in their in the lives of their clients. That's wonderful. And, you know, I mean, this is such an obvious cliche, but people always say, you know, kids don't come with an instruction manual. And it's like, now you've made one. Yeah, this is that manual that I really believe every parent should read because it covers literally the basics and fundamentals of how to set yourself up to embody the greatest consciousness. So I I created 20 steps. The first six steps are in stage one. And stage one kind of lays out the fundamentals of conscious parenting. So it may seem a lot like my other books, but stage two and three are brand new sections. I've never talked about this before in any of my books where I really help parents break patterns and notice their dysfunctions and see how they're getting angry and why they're getting angry and really break the patterns in real time. Every chapter has practice tools and practice exercises to really embed the teachings in a very practical, applicable way. Because at the end of the day, you and I know theory is wonderful and it's very important But at the end of the day, it's the practical. You have to send your clients home and tell them, now go practice for a week and come back to me. So this book is almost like that that manual that you wish your kids came home with, that you grow with your kid and week by week, you become a better parent. So I almost encourage parents to read one chapter over a few days, really distill it down for yourself, journal. I have exercises after every chapter and embed the principles in a very deep way. That's fantastic and so needed. And like you said, the first stage, these, I think we all as adults have these ideas about what a good parent looks like and what a good child looks like, you know, a child whose behavior is the way you want it to be. And if they're not behaving the way you want them to, whatever it is, whether it's their academic performance, their school behavior, their home behavior, their behavior in other social environments with peers or with other adults, you know, we when we get some kind of a report that they're not measuring up, we can really take that as a personal failure as a parent. And then we can react to that. Yep. And, you know, as we know now that our childhood rules and our childhood baggage impacts us so deeply as adults. But what happens in the parenting process is one step even deeper than what happens to us as adults. What happens to us as as parents is that now our children trigger us almost back to our own childhood. So not only are we unhealed as walking, talking, working adults, but in the world, which the, the world has plenty of triggers to trigger us. But with children, that becomes very compounded, very profound, because we're dealing with the same age of human that we were when we got royally messed up, right? So literally our children are the gateway to remember all our suppressed issues. So it's a very potentially volatile situation that occurs in parenthood, and we're not prepared for it. Like you said, all we imagine and fantasize about when we become parents is that we're going to raise these amazing, successful, happy children. No one tells us that we're going to be losing our shit and acting worse than our three-year-old, right? No one tells us we're going to be having tantrums literally like a two-year-old. And when that happens, the disillusionment with our own self is so great because the traditional paradigm set us up to fantasize so much about how great we were going to be, that when we get reduced to a heap on the floor, that delta from the pedestalization that we thought we would have to the utter lunacy we enter into as a parent, that delta is so shocking that we're mortified. And what do we do with this mortification? Well, we can only do two things, blame the child or blame the self. So this is what we do. We get angry with the kid and we look at ourselves as utter failures. So what my work does at this book, The Parenting Map, is it starts out by talking about the absolute abyss of despair, frustration, 
lunacy, insanity that you're going to feel on a day-to-day basis as a parent, because no one talks about that. I don't want to set parents up to think that, oh, you're going to raise this amazing kid in a room full of medals and trophies. That's what we think parenting is all about. Lovely picnics in the park, lullabies, you know, in at bedtime mm-hmm. and going to trophy award shows where your kid is winning every prize. Hello. They're the best at everything. The best at everything. That's what we're thinking, that my kid's going to go to some fancy ID league and I'm going to feel so great. And we're waiting for that day, right? We're waiting for the trophy and that prize where we're going to crown ourselves as the world's best parent, world's best parent. And when that doesn't happen and doesn't look like it's going to happen, we fall into this turmoil and we blame the kid, which is why we yell, scream, punish, blame, shame and guilt, or we shame and guilt ourselves. And neither of them lead to liberation or empowerment. Wow. Can you just say something about that last point that you just said? How does it not lead to liberation and empowerment or what does it lead to? Yeah, you know, we are set up by the traditional parenting paradigm to fantasize in a very rigid fashion. All parents have the same damn fantasy. It's the same movie. My kid will be happy and successful and I will be the best parent ever, right? And we're all going to be frolicking into the sun. So lovely and (laughs) joyful, the happy family. This is our greatest desire. It's our greatest vision. But the traditional parenting paradigm says you can make it happen and you should make it happen. And in fact, if you're a good parent and you have good children, it will happen. Now we walk into the parenting process thinking that this is supposed to be our destiny. Very quickly, like literally three hours after birth, you realize this is a show, right? Like I remember (laughs) having given birth and I was like dying. I was like, when the nurses left the room and left me alone with this creature, I was like panicking, right? But I did not want to tell her that because I wanted to act competent. But I was like, where the hell are you (laughs) going? Don't leave my kid with this crazy person, aka me. And the, the woman next door to me, you know, it was cordoned off by a curtain. She couldn't breastfeed her kid and the husband and she were arguing because it was hurting her. But he was like, you Mm got to do it. And she didn't. She was crying and the baby's crying. And I was like, here, come, I'll give you my boo. But it was like a mess in there, right? It was like not a good scene. But I just felt right away, wow, this is the world's best secret. Like no one told me I am going to be in hell. I am exhausted. My body is a wreck. My hormones are out of whack. I do not want anyone touching me. I don't like my husband anymore because he gets to sleep and not, doesn't have boobs. So he's scot-free. I'm feeling guilty. All eyes are on me. And then that's the easy time, apparently. Like that's the easy years of parenting. And then it just goes on and on from there. We're supposed to raise the kindest person. I always say that, oh, we're supposed to raise a little mix of Mahatma Gandhi, a little mix of Mother Teresa, some Julia Roberts, some Einstein, some Michael Phelps, like a little bit of everything that we are so not, but we're supposed to produce this child. So the setup, and it's more for the mom, I have to say, because yeah. traditionally the dad is kind of allowed and endorsed to go be a pilot, to go be a sailor, to go be a surgeon. We're not allowed to do that so easily. Now, can we do it? Yes, but culture frowns on us, right? So all the burden falls on the mother. Now, if we were parenting our children in beautiful villages, like I imagine it used to be with the aunties and the grandmothers and everyone sharing the child raising, okay, then the mothers are okay. But we are in these nuclear isolated pods and we are strapped for cash, strapped for energy, strapped for resources, and heavily burdened by guilt. That we have in in a large amount. And it's all Mm. because culture sets us up to raise these amazing human beings. And what I do in my book, The Parenting Map that we're talking about today, is I really train parents to discard the vision of raising a superhuman being, like end it, crash it, burn it, crumble it, eviscerate it, tear it, throw it in the garbage. You are not here to raise anyone superhuman. That's your ego talking. Everyone wants to Mm -hmm. be Michael Phelps' mother. 
I don't know. I don't know if you want to sit there on the bleachers every day and watch your kid who then, you know, also he's talked about how it was a, it was a very torturous time as well. And he had to suffer a lot of anxiety. So everything comes with a shadow, but culture doesn't allow us to see the other side. So I always tell mm-hmm. parents, no, you're not raising a superhuman. Please just raise a human, just raise an ordinary human. And in my own parenting, I quickly discarded those fantasies because I saw how toxic they were. And I can happily say my very ordinary human being is going to be 20 next week. And she's just fine as an ordinary person and is beautiful in her ordinariness. But what that did for me is that it liberated me. Every day wasn't a struggle looking for Mount Everest to climb and get a medal. Every day wasn't about being the best parent on the block raising the most well-mannered child. It did not matter if she was in no activities. It didn't matter to me that she couldn't speak 16 languages because I released myself from this obnoxious, murderous fantasy that I am in any way even capable of raising a superhuman human being because I'm not superhuman myself. See, it's this ego that conscious parenting kills And the ego comes from culture and it's a lie, but we all have this ego of wanting to raise a superhuman, which is so burdensome, not just for the child, but for the parent. Yes. Thank you for explaining that. And I I feel like as I'm listening to you and I have a 26 year old and a 24 year old, and I had to think because they both just turned their ages, but I'm like, wow, I kind of still think, I think they're the best thing there is. Like, I think they're the best thing there is. So is that, that's probably my ego. It's somehow like some reflection where I think they're wonderful. So it makes me feel good about myself or something, but, but I'm beginning to consider how my projections and my, you know, fantasies of their achievements that I couldn't do or whatever are mine and not theirs. And, you know, a little late, but the real <laughs> test is to see your children without their identification to achievement and success and yourself, you know, and that's why I I teach spirituality and Eastern spirituality along with Western psychology because Eastern meditation teaches how the ego gets so wrapped up in the doing that we begin to think we are the doing and we are the mm-hmm. achievement and we're not. That is a great trap. And so when I teach conscious parenting, I teach parents to not identify A, with their own ego of being a parent, but then being the parent of a successful child or parent of a happy child or parent of a rich child or skinny child or beautiful child, whatever you've decided is good, or even the parent of a good child, you know, and for the the parent to see their own limitations with beauty and celebration, not with abnegation and guilt, to say, yeah, you know what? I am actually not good at math and that's okay, but I'm really good at this. I don't need to be good at everything. In the same way, your kid doesn't need to be good at everything. You don't even need to say, you know, they're good at math, but they're great at poetry. No, they're just not good at math. It's okay, you know, to not be good at everything. And this hyper-realized culture we live in right now says that we have to be Mm hyper-realized in every single thing. You know, now it's, you look at we women trying to have the best earlobes, the best jawline, the best nose, upturned eyebrows, eyelashes. I mean, every measure of our being is now tied up to perfection. And it is a tragic lie because our self is never and can never be measured by the external metrics. Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience. And one thing that has made it so much easier is Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn. It's intuitive. The customer support is second to none. 
And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. If you've ever looked for a trauma therapist online, you know it can be really confusing and overwhelming to try to figure out if the person has the right combination of training and experience and specialization for you. That's why I created Trauma Therapist Network. Trauma Therapist Network is a website where you can search for trauma therapists, learn about trauma through reading articles and listening to podcast episodes, including this podcast and my other podcast, Trauma Chat. And it's also a supportive community for therapists. So Trauma Therapist Network has something for you, whether you are a person who is searching for a therapist or if you are a therapist, you will find support and help at Trauma Therapist Network. To learn more, go to traumatherapistnetwork.com. Yeah. And I like the way you have sort of distilled the external metrics of our culture down to achievement, beauty, intelligence. You know, you've named what they are and it's really all these same kinds of perfectionistic ideals that even if anyone attains them, no one can hold on to them. I mean, you can't be at the top and stay at the top forever in every way. It's just not possible. It's it's an illusion because the top doesn't even exist. It's it's a top. If you're yeah. at the bottom, that looks like the top. When you get to the top, there's another top. Nothing is right. the ultimate top except death. <laughs> you know, so that's the that's the yeah. final. But everything else is constant flow. There is no such thing as oh, I I have to get somewhere because life is a constant evolution. So when you treat your children with this wisdom that they are not here to fulfill your ego. They are not here to be a product of your imagination. They are not here to get to any top because there's no such thing as a top. And let every every other kid go do that. Let every other, other parent drive their kid crazy. But you don't have to. You have to buy out of this traditional model. And my teaching parents is really to opt out of the insanity of culture because it's a lie. You and I are therapists. We know that the most successful adults are the most tortured, right? The prettiest women yes. are the most tortured. It, there's no such thing as, as a life without shadow. So don't put too much emphasis on the illusion of the light because more light, more shadow. So just let your children evolve into who they're meant to be within, of course, a certain barometer, right? You want to push your children. Parents always say, but don't you want to push your children? Yeah. You want to push them a little bit out of their comfort zone, but you can't push them so out of their comfort zone, which is your comfort zone, because then they're going to be a fish out of their water. They can succeed in their water, of course. They can be the best they can be, but they can't be the best you want them to be, right? And Mm -hmm. conscious parenting really zones in on who your child is in section three of this book, and I'll hold it up again. The Parenting Map, (laughs) because it's such a pretty cover. Section three of this book, I I talk about how parents need to master kids' psychology. You know, we become parents and we don't even understand psychology. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And every kid comes with their own psychology. And finding the superpower in that psychology is more precious, more valuable than making your kid into a different psychology. Right. So if you have a shy, introverted kid, I teach in this book how you can honor that and celebrate it as a superpower. How if you have the explosive kid, that is a superpower. You work with what you have. Right. The phrase you bloom where you're planted in the same way you parent the kid that you have. Not the kid that culture says you should have, not the kid you wanted to have, not your neighbor's kid, not your grandparents kid, your kid. Or the kid you were. You have to really zone into your kid. And and I have to say, my child taught me that. I wanted the kid of my fantasy, which was a super idealized version of myself. I didn't get that kid. I got another kid who was her own authentic being. And it took me a long time. It took me two years 
of clashing with her. It, within the first two years, I realized, boy, who is this person? This isn't my fantasy. It's not coming true. So I tried to put her into my mold. I really did. And I'm unabashed to talk about it because my, my ego took over. But then one day I saw myself killing her spirit. And I realized that I'm an absolute insane human being to do this to a beautiful being. And the reason I was doing it is, again, because I thought I could. I thought I should. And that's when I began to call my own ego into scrutiny. And I began doing it for all parents. And, you know, I, it's a hard message for parents to realize that their ego is in full throttle. And no, it's not that they love their kid and not that they're doing it for the kid's benefit. I was shoving my kid into my fantasy, not because I loved her. It's because I loved my own ego. And until I realized that, I was ruining my kid's life. And the moment I began to surrender to her authentic essence and see her for her own being, wow, everything changed. I've suddenly found her, her my teacher. I realized, wow, she's here to teach me. Like her being is so amazing. It's so foreign to anything I was. I was the epitome of the good girl. She was the epitome of the quote unquote not good girl. But, that, but she was actually more good than I was because I was just colluding with my parents' ego and she was my ego buster. So I always say the quote unquote bad kids are actually the best kids because they awaken you. They're the ones who send their parents to therapy, right? They're the ones who drive their parents crazy that they go seek help. And that's why I love the quote unquote bad kid because they are the ego busters and the awakeners of the parent. Yeah, well, that's a that's a beautiful description. And thanks for sharing about your own. I know you do talk about that often about the way you parented your daughter and what you've learned. And but it's so powerful because as a therapist, and you know this, I'm sure when parents want their kids to get therapy, it's like make my kid be how I need them to be so that I can be happy because this is a problem that their behavior or their, you know, emotional situation is too much for me. And the parent often doesn't see that they have a part in it. You know, oh, the parents never see that. And it's not the parents fault. Listen, I didn't see it. I bet you didn't see it at first because no one talks about it. And when I came up, right. when I came up with conscious parenting, I was really scared to go out there because it was such an unpopular message back then. Now it's the trend, but yeah. Back then, parents used to get really upset with me. I lost income, people fired me, and I had to really question whether it was a wise career choice, but I continued to do it anyway because it was the truth. And we don't want to look in the mirror. We don't want to see our co-creation. We would rather blame our children and find fault in them. I mean, I've often said to parents, would you rather think your kid is bad than look at yourself? And they're like, yes. It's too painful to look at ourselves. I get it. You know, it's we have to have compassion for the parent as well because they weren't told that parenting would be the place where they need to look at their issues. They wouldn't have had the 15 children. They had the children because they thought, finally, they'll get someone to have power over. Finally, someone who would love them unconditionally. Finally, someone who would give them the fantasy of the happy home that they never had. So that's why they were having children. Mm hmm. You just really dropped some knowledge right there. <laughs> that was those points. I, I wanted to write those down. Those were really important. Thank you. Wow. Well, of course, there's so much we could talk about, but we don't have that much time. I, I think what I would love to know if you could go into is where you talk about in stage two. So I first wanted to mention how, you know, for most of us parents, we don't even know what we're doing. We are just unconsciously walking through this thing and thinking it's supposed to be a certain way and we're supposed to know what we're doing and we don't. And so we just are projecting all over the place. But once we begin to realize, oh, I have some un unhealthy dysfunctional patterns, I'm really interested if you could talk about what happens in that second stage of, of your process. So the first stage is just getting the conscious parenting mindset correct. So we've kind of talked about how the traditional mindset has messed us up. What is the conscious parenting mindset? So I really lay it down very beautifully, simply, a lot of stories in stage one. Stage two is the most powerful work you will ever do as an adult, right? And they do it with you in therapy. They do it with me. And I kind of laid it down for the lay person. 
And that is realizing that you are actually living a pattern, not a life. You're actually living a pattern. When I first realized that about myself, I was like, it cannot be true. I, I really resisted that because every player looks feels different. much more complex. Yeah. And it feels like every player is so different. You know, and I left India and now I'm in America. What? But as Don Kabat Zinn says, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> so the pattern mm -hmm. is just the same damn pattern. So with so it is with parenting. You can literally create the same pattern with all your children. It doesn't matter who the kid is because you kind of dictate that mood, that ambiance. So in this section, I talk about how parents absolutely need to realize their styles. So I broke it down into five egoic patterns to make it easy for the parent. And they are all underpinned by an emotion. So some people are quick to anger. And if anger is their primary default emotion when they're triggered, then they are typically going to wear the mask of the fighter, right? The exploder, the screamer, the yeller, the punisher, the fighter. If one's mode is more anxious and more anxiety prone, fluttering, nervousness, you know, trembling, more introverted, typically that person will be more fixer, you know, especially if they're people pleasers, they cannot tolerate anxiety in their children or in themselves, they go to become fixers. That's me too. Is that you, Laura? Speaking <laughs> to yourself. Yes. I think all good girls are fixers. And then we can become a lot of other things, but we start off with fixing, then we get angry. So then the, the other parent I talk about is the Fena parent, who is very much all about how it looks. And that would be your stage mom, your, you know, your prototypical dad, the sports dad, who is more concerned with the accolades, the trophies, how it all looks. Often people who come from traditional cultures or religions will be feigners. They care about how we show up in public and fitting in is very important. Then we have the freezer parent. That's very common too. You know, you would think that the freezer is not so common. Boy, I think all of us actually in many ways are actually freezing. So we talk about, mm -hmm. I talk about the freezer parent who is a major avoider and conflict avoider, emotion avoider, just do not, does not want to deal. And when you have one parent who's a freezer, then the other parent is often trying to overmanage the situation. And then you have the fleer parent who really abandons the ship, either physically or emotionally. They just cannot deal. And then too, the other parent has to pick up all the slack. So recognizing these patterns, and then they all have subcategories, so important. So it's a fun, it's a fun chapter because you get to identify your own parents, your friends, your brothers, your sisters, and you get to see, wow, yeah, that's what I do. You know, when I identified as the fixer, then I was given, I gave myself the permission with compassion. None of these types are bad. They're just patterns. We don't put judgment on them. But when I recognize that I'm really a fixer and I'm working out of anxiety, in the book, then I, I teach parents how to tap into that anxiety before you become a fixer. And I began to create that pause, you know, when I would notice my trembling of the, the chest and my palpitations, I immediately realized that, wow, my inner child is triggered. And before I unleash on my real child, I need to go within and deal with that inner child. So in that section, I talk about the two eyes. So your inner child and your imposter ego. And then I talk about cultivating the third eye, which is your adult self, your insightful self. And I teach people how to create a dialogue between the inner child and the ego mediated by the adult self. That's what we teach in therapy, right? What is therapy? This is therapy in a nutshell, right? Teaching parents how to mediate their own needs without reacting to their children. But consciousness and awareness is the key to do that. If we're not even aware... Right. Till I wrote this book, I really did not fully identify with compassion as a fixer. And it enlightened me. It, I didn't shame myself. I just enlightened myself. Wow, your tendency is just to zoom in and swoop in and save the day. And I see it in all my relationships. You know, the parenting relationship is a prototype of all our relationships. So you identify as the fixer as well? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, so many of these patterns feel familiar to my family and my family of origin, but and then my partner's family. But yeah, the good girl fixer also with the 
freezer, you know, avoiding things that I didn't know what to do with or avoiding conflict a lot. I've gotten a lot better with that, but yeah. And it's, I think it's so helpful to even have some examples of types and just without really judging them, just like, which one are you, you know? But I also noticed that they seem to align with some of the trauma reactions, you know? Oh, completely. And it's, it's based on our imprint from childhood. So there's no shame, yeah. no shade, no shame. But I think reading through all of that, and in the in the book, I encourage people, even if you're not an exploder, you should read through that because it will help you have more compassion for the people in your life who's who've been exploders. So when you're reading that section and you're breaking your patterns, what you're also doing is reparenting yourself and healing from your own patterns and your own parents' patterns. So if you, even if you're not a fixer, but you are reading about the fixer, you can resonate. Perhaps your mother was a fixer or your, your, your sister was a fixer and how that impacted the dynamic. So this is about reparenting yourself, really. This book was written, you know, if you pick up this book, read it assiduously, do all the exercises, have tons of exercises after every chapter. At the end of this book, Boy, you will be an agent of change, not only in your own life, but really for humanity. This is a, it's a service to humanity to read this book. It's taking accountability for your bush. It's not passing it down <laughs> to your children. And I, 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 you know, I know I've written it. So it sounds like I'm, I'm being laudatory of my own book, but I don't care. It's really written <laughs> in service of healing. And why? Because we need to not pass it down. I always used to tell myself, you, you know, we are going to screw up our kids somewhat. There's no way. By age three, we're going to have screwed up our kids somewhat. By age 15, a whole lot. The point is not to screw up your kid because you're going to screw up your kid. <laughs> There's no such escape. The point is to evolve as we're going along the journey and to awaken. So even if you're a parent of an 18-year-old, you need to read this book because it's never too late to awaken more. I need to read this book over and over because every day I forget. So this is not about perfection and this is not about, oh, my kid is a grown up now. I don't need to read it. No, you do because there's no end to awakening and becoming a better parent because when you do, you keep helping others. Your friend could come to you and you could help them in a better way. You could deal with your partner in a better way. This book is really about taking accountability for your crap and really healing that and, and not passing the crap on anymore. So I so always say, I, I will screw up my kid, but I want to screw up my kid less. Every day I want to screw them up a little bit less. And that's really the endeavor here. Yeah. Oh, and it's, it's so true. It's, you know, these patterns have just been repeating and repeating and repeating for generations and generations and something has to happen to stop things. But, you know, culture is very persistent in trying to keep its, you know, homeostasis going, right? Yeah. Beautifully said, but we are culture, right? People are often say, yeah, culture, culture. I say culture all the time, but but then at the end of the day, we are culture. This conversation is culture. And, you know, I, I have annual seminars and the 500 people in the room and I remind them, no, you are a big culture right now. So you're going to go out yeah. there and be culture. Culture is us. Wherever we go, we are culture. So I don't want yeah. us to feel victimized that there's this big, gloomy, doomy, big, mm -hmm. you know, bad brother out there called culture. No, we are culture. That's why I speak up the way I do. That's why you do the work you do, because you know, even if it's 10 people, you are helping change culture. And that's a beautiful thing. And, and all the listeners listening, and I know you have people who are coaches and therapists, I want them to know and parents that all that they can do to help enlighten humanity is a big thing. And I have this motto, one is a million. It's about one moment at a time and taking every interaction seriously with intention, dedication, devotion to wisdom and compassion. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing right now. Yes, that's true. And, you know, when you said that about culture, about what I said, it's like if we're not healing ourselves, we're contributing to the negative effects that we were talking about of, for example, like colonization, imperialism and 
oppression. But if we are liberating ourselves and our families, and we're contributing to liberation and empowerment and positive aspects. Yes. Yeah, so we get to decide humanity. Right. So we get to decide how we show up. If culture has said that a good kid is a straight A student, you as a parent have the obligation to deconstruct that and not swallow the pill because that does not make a good kid. So whose responsibility is it? Is it cultures, right? Then we're going to be eternal victims. Is it your poor kids? Because your kid is like, I can't get an A in that, mom. I, I just can't. So now should they feel bad for being a bad kid? Who gets to shift the tide, right? And that's where parenting and conscious parenting is really a game changer for humanity. It's not just for your own kid. It's 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 so creating this ripple effect. And that's why I created my institute so that there can be hundreds of people who can be ambassadors of this message. So it's not just on me because I'm very limited and, and, you know, I'm going to die. So other people need to be out there as ambassadors. And that's what we're trying to do. It's a revolutionarily new way of parenting. And I think it's healed so many people and it needs to be out there as the next way that we parent our children. Yes, I agree with you 100%. So where can people find the Institute? Everything. Wonderful. So they can go to DR for Dr. Shifali, S for Sam, H for Harry, E, F for Frank, A-L-I dot com. And they'll find my book, The Parenting Map. They'll find all my courses. I have so many courses on relationships, healthy eating, children, adolescents, anger, all of it. And also my mm. lovely institute under the tab Institute. And yeah, if you are a coach or somebody who wants to be a coach and become a conscious parenting coach and expand your repertoire of skills, my program is phenomenal. I'm very proud of it. People love it. They come out completely transformed. It's five months. It's online. And yeah, this book is called The Parenting Map. Thank you for allowing me to showcase it and spread word about it. Oh, you're very welcome. And I'm so grateful that you were able to come and spend time with me and our audience today and, and talk about your book. I'll, I'll link to your website, all your books, and explain how people can find all that good stuff and your institute in the show notes. And But thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. I've really enjoyed talking with you about this. Such an important topic. Thank you for having me. And thanks to all the people out there listening. Thank you so much. Thank you to TraumaTherapistNetwork.com for sponsoring this week's episode. Therapists, Trauma Therapist Network membership is reopening March 6th and the waiting list gets early access and discounted pricing. So join the waiting list now by going to go.TraumaTherapistNetwork.com slash join. There's a link in the show notes. Can't wait to see you in the membership. There's New membership levels, we have options for group practice owners and Canadian therapists to join as well. So if you've been wanting to become a member of Trauma Therapist Network, this is the time. Go join the waiting list now and we'll see you when membership opens March 6th. Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached to see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.